before we, we start a new sermon series, because by God's grace we uh, uh, finished um, the book of Matthew, um, I wanted to, uh, I thought I was going to do one sermon, but um, I realized I probably need to do two. And uh, the title of the message this morning is The Absolute Necessity of the Local Church. The Absolute Necessity of the Local Church. Like, like I said, I, I wanted to share my vision, you know, start the first sermon of the, the new year. I wanted to share my vision of um, our church this morning and where I... I uh, believe we ought to go and you know all these things but I realized that I needed to share this sermon first and the main reason for that is because for my vision to work <coughs> two things have to happen one it has to be what God wants because if it's not what God wants I don't care what I want right it doesn't matter and two you all have to be behind it right as a church family. So uh, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're gonna um, we're gonna bounce around a little bit this morning in God's Word. And notice I call it God's Word because it is God's Word. All right, King James Bible. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, toward the back of the the Bible. Okay, everyone there? Mm -hmm. We're going to start with verse 15, and just a couple verses in, in that uh, chapter. This is uh, Paul writing to Timothy, right? Remember Timothy, uh, you know, took Timothy under his wing and, and uh, <coughs> trained him and all, right? And so he's writing to him. Timothy is now off, uh, you know, pastoring the, the church. So he says, but if I tarry long, that thou may knowest how long thou oughtest to be, I'm sorry, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the, is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, <coughs> seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Amen. So what I wanted to talk about this morning is the importance of the local church like ours and about the house of God and about how crucial the local church is. And look at verse 15. One of the things they stated there was that, uh, that we know how to behave ourselves, right? How we're to behave ourselves in the house of God. And why? Because church is that important. Because it's so important. As a matter of fact, I put this in your bulletin. When we come to church, it's to listen to God's word being preached, to sing the songs, it's to behave as the Bible says. And why is church so important? He said, it's the pillar and ground of the truth, the church of the living God. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. Look what it says on the screen here, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So church must be pretty important if the Lord purchased it with his own blood. Wouldn't you agree? He says, feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. But the church is something that today is going out of fashion. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. A lot of people don't think that church is very important. It used to be that li people's lives revolved around church. Communities revolved around church. 
When Sandy and I moved to Virginia in 1985 for, uh, for me to go to graduate school, to Radford, Virginia, we found out very quickly that the blue laws were still in effect. It meant that nothing was open on Sunday. I mean, you, you can't find a thing open on Sunday. And why? Because it's the Lord's Day. It's the day that everyone's behind was supposed to be in a church building. And for many of them, this meant a morning service and an evening service. The day was dedicated to the Lord. But today, Sunday, for many people, it's just another day, right? And the prevailing attitude today is that church services are optional. Getting together with fellow believers is optional. Serving the Lord is for other people, not me. But look what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So as we see here, apparently there were some that were forsaking the assembly, uh, the assembling of uh, themselves together, right? They weren't getting together with the assembly. And he says, don't be like them. He said, you know, there are a lot of people who quit church or, or who never go to church because they don't think it's important to assemble together. They believe on Jesus. They're saved. But for some reason, they forsake the assembly of themselves together. And that's what church is, right? And he says, don't be like them. Refuse to forsake the assembly, as is the matter of some. But exhort one another so much more as ye see the day approaching. So what the Lord is saying is as we get, I mean, I'm sorry, what, what Paul is saying here. Uh, God is through Paul. That as we get closer to the Lord returning, we need church more and more. But I put this in your bulletin. He said, now is not the time for less church. It's just the opposite. We need more church. But I can't tell you of how many churches I know of that used to have, for example, a Sunday evening service. I remember when Sandy and I first started going to, to Mercy Baptist. We would go Sunday morning. After, after a little while that we, we started going, we'd go Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evening. Not because we were trying to work our way into heaven, because you can't, or not because we were trying to get a gold star from the pastor. Uh, you know what I mean? It just seemed like the thing to do. That's what you did. You know, I want to learn as much as I can. I want to be with these people, get to know them as much as I can. You know, I came from a tradition where you didn't know who you went to church with. You know, you could go your entire life going to that same building and have no clue who the people were. As a matter of fact, a lot of people try to get out of the building before the service is over. Right? I remember one time we, we went to Mass over in Steubenville, and right after the service, there was a fight out in the parking lot. As the, as the first, I mean, they were actually coming to blows. Yeah. I, I was starting out of here first. You know, man, i got to get away from this stuff. <laughs> Praise God I did. Uh, so we need church more, but churches, there's a church, yeah, church is less and less and less. Have you noticed that? Uh, the, the Sunday mornings, oh, we don't need to go Sunday, you know, uh, I'll just relax. But now let, let me ask you, uh, have you noticed the depravity of our society and of our world, or is it just me? Huh? Have you noticed how the evil, sinful, depraved attitudes and behaviors are increasing exponentially? I mean, Exponentially. It's unbelievable what's on TV nowadays that wasn't just 10 years ago. I mean, it's just taken off. And it's getting, they might as well <coughs> shut down the FCC. I don't know what it's for anymore. But let me tell you something. 
if I were a parent nowadays, you know, now that I'm saved, if I were a parent with young children nowadays, I would want church services to be every day. I would want my children to be here learning every day. I would want them to be around you godly people every day. Amen? Amen. Every day. That's what I would want. And some of you might be thinking, well, when I was a kid, we used to go to church all the time. You know, We went to church uh, every week and, and sometimes Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. But these days, the average Christian attitude is, I'll, I'll, get, I'll go when I get around to it. You know, something else better isn't going on. But God says here that as we see the day approaching, as things get darker and darker, we need to be in church more and more. Exhorting each other. Provoking each other. And so what does this mean, this exhorting, this provoking, right? Uh, or to provoke each other into love and the good works. Now, provoking doesn't mean like, you know, trying to get someone to be angry. That isn't what this means here. Provoking is, is another word for exhorting, and both of those words mean to enthusiastically encourage. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, Arnold. <laughs> oh, be back. Um, so, um, uh, so that's it. Is that um, it's enthusiastically encouraging. That's what we're to do when we're around each other. Encouraging somebody to be in church. You know, hey, I sure hope to see you this Sunday. You know, you, I'll see you this Sunday, right? Hey, we missed you last week. You're going to be there this week, I hope. And some might be saying, well, uh, I don't know if I should do that. Well, the Bible tells us to do it. It doesn't say if you feel like it. It says, do it. We're all to do it. Instead of just worrying about ourselves when we come to, to the church service. You know, maybe there's somebody who hasn't been here for a while and you're wondering what happened to them. You know, there's a way to satisfy that curiosity. Uh, what do you think it is? Call Ask them, them right? Call, Call them. them. Yeah. Ask them. Hey, you doing okay? <clears throat> right? And first, let's establish, are they still alive? Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing them, right? Okay, now where can we go from here? But you call them. You get a hold of them. You know, show them that you care about them. We ought to consider one another. We ought to think of one another and not just ourselves, but to exhort each other, one another, to be with us in our church gathering. And you say, well, why? What's the point? I mean, do we really need this? Do we really need this? So please turn to Acts chapter 20, if you would. Acts chapter 20. We do it because God says it's important. By the way, I forgot to mention, we're going to have communion, celebrate communion uh, after the sermon, and then we'll have our lunch uh, afterwards. So Acts chapter 20. Okay. <clears throat> All right, we're going to begin with verse 18, by God's grace. And the Bible reads, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you, what are the next three words? At all, At all seasons. At all seasons. So was Paul the type of guy who just went to church once in a while? No. You know, or when, uh, you know, did he go through long periods of it? No, no. He said, I've been with you at all seasons. He said, I was always there. I was always with you. And then he says this in verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And now I kept back, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly 
from house and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit in, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to reckon this day, that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So in other words, everyone's heard it, right? I've been there. For I uh, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So why is church so important? Because church is not a place just where you go to hear God's word preached. Because if that were the case, you could hear the God, the God's word preached a lot of different ways, right? You don't have to leave your home. You can hear it on the radio. Um, you know, if you hear someone that preaches it correctly. Uh, you could hear it on TV if you find someone that preaches it correctly. Uh, you could uh, watch it online, right? Uh, there, there are a lot of different things. If that's all there is to it, that's all you would have to do. But it's not just to listen to it. And I put this in more. No, the, because the point of church is to band together with other people who believe what you believe and to exhort one another, encourage one another, and consider one another. And notice, why did Paul say that none of these things move me? I mean, keep this in mind. Paul was beaten. He was thrown into prison. And he tells them, I've been with you in all seasons. What is he doing? He's lifting up the importance of getting together. He's lifting up the importance of church. And he's saying, nothing can move me. And why was that the case? Well, think about this. Psalm 92, verse 13 and 14. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. So I'm saying, look, if you're planted in church, that's what's going to keep you living the Christian life even into your old age. You're still going to be soldiers winning souls for Christ. You're still going to be serving God. And why? Because you're planted in God's house. So let me ask you this morning. Are you planted in this church? Are you? Uh, are you? Yes. 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 Are your roots deep in this church? Is this your church? Yes. Yes. Amen. Praise God. And you think of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. 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 Yeah. Forever. Amen. Forever. So I put this in your bulletin as well. So church is what's going to keep you in it for the long haul. You know, we have our ups and downs, don't we? There are times when we get discouraged, when we make ourselves depressed. Sometimes we just want to throw in the towel. You know, we start to uh, be overwhelmed in our thoughts about what's going on, get discouraged. And it's church that can keep you going, you see? where you'd be around other people to encourage you. I don't know if you noticed, but we take turns being discouraged. You know, we're not all discouraged at the same time. Right? If we were, then we wouldn't be much help to each other. See? 
So, so that's why we can encourage each other. We can exhort each other. You know, you see someone come in, their, their head's kind of, oh, sister, what, what's the matter? Yeah. How, how, tell me what's going on. We can lift each other up, as it says in Galatians 6. Bear ye one another's burdens. And let me tell you about it. Just seeing it on Facebook isn't bearing each other's burdens. You know? We need to be around each other to bear each other's burdens. Have people, you know, shoulder to cry on. Leaning on each other in time of need. So I don't think people really realize how much they are hurting others. You know, um, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about just generally speaking, you know, not, not necessarily specifically our church, you know, when, when they don't come to church services, you know, I don't think they do. You know, like, you know, well, I was up late last night watching the game or out on a date or whatnot, so I think I'll just stay in bed this morning. They don't realize how important they are to the congregation. And as I put in your sermon notes, when you are not here, you are not there for someone. You know, you might say, well, how am I important to others? Well, if you're questioning that, be important to others. Right? You know, involve yourselves with others. Anytime we gather, whether it's for Sunday, Sunday school or worship service or Bible study, it is not a show. It is not a performance. It is not a passive event like a concert or going to the movies or something. It's a family gathering. It's a family gathering that encourages us uh, to obey the Lord, you know, to grow in the Lord. To get through life's difficulties. You know, you hear me referring to us over and over as a church family, don't you? A church family. I do that because, first of all, we are a church family. We are a family. And secondly, it's to emphasize the fact that we are a specific family. Right? Not everyone is in your biological family, right? And not everyone is in this family. Sure, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are in other churches, but they're not a part of our church family. What we do doesn't affect them. What they do doesn't affect us, right? We are a separate church family. And, and I also put this in your sermon notes, but the Bible tells us that one of the things that we have to be on guard against is the development of a one world religion. Amen. And that's exactly what's going on today. That's what's going on in so-called Christianity. This evil ecumenical movement that teaches as long as there's a cross on the building, they're one of us. You see? And that is wrong, wrong, wrong. And you might say, well, Pastor Aldo, that sounds kind of divisive. You know, aren't we supposed to be united? Well, let me ask you something. Do you want to be united with the Jehovah's Witness? No. no. Do you want to be united with the Mormons? No. Uh, uh, why not? Of course not, right? Why not? Because they're wrong about Jesus. They're wrong about salvation. So therefore, why would we be united with the Roman Catholic Church? Why if they're wrong about salvation? Why would we be united with Pentecostals who teach you can lose your salvation? Why would we be united with Jews who reject Jesus altogether? You see? Yep. But you see, we have these ministerial associations made up of all sorts of faiths. You won't see me there. We have these ecumenical services that where they can't even mention the name of Jesus because it might offend the Jews or the Muslims. <laughs> you won't see me there. I don't get it. An ecumenical, what is that? You know, I'm going to go to a Christian service, not an ecumenical. So, 
I, I put this in your bulletin as well. A part of the importance of the independent local Christian church is to protect the faith. We are an independent, fundamental Baptist church. And it's important for us to be independent, to focus on God's word, and not be influenced by, you know, all these other outside wrong influences. As a matter of fact, I put in your bulletin, even if a church outside of ours is comprised of actual believers, we still might be called upon to avoid yoking up with them. Why? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every... What's the next word? Brother. Brother! So these are fellow Christians, right? That ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. You know, in other words, the, the biblical teaching that he received. So if we have churches that are contrary to God's word, even if they're a brother, we are to withdraw from them. We should not be united with them. We should separate from them. Why? A little bit of leaven. Just a little bit. However, we are not to treat a brother like an enemy. We're just not to yoke up with them. Where, where do we get this? From 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. If any man obey not a word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. See if you can help him out. See if you can help him with God's word to understand. Just don't yoke up with that and have that enter into the church. <coughs> and so I also put this in your notes. We shouldn't associate with pastors and churches that are promoting or even condoning this ecumenical movement. It's a part of the devil's plan for a one world religion, a one world church, and a one world government. <coughs> and it's going more and more and more in that direction. And we need to be separated from it. We need to focus on our local church and be as pure in our biblical teaching and preaching as possible by God's grace. We need to focus on our church. And by the way, just in case anyone here, th here thinks that he or she is not important <coughs> in our church, you know, like somehow, well, you know, I'm, I'm really not important. or uh, You know, it's, it's a bunch of baloney. And here's how I know that. Not only do I know that already, but God's word tells us. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, I know I go off on tangents sometimes, <laughs> but as an aside, uh, I saw a guy yesterday, I'm sure a very well-meaning guy and all, you know, I, I don't have a beef with him, um, post on one of the things on uh, groups on Facebook, I'm, I'm looking for a non-denominational church, and, you know, and my first thought was, why does anyone seek a non-denominational church? Uh, is it because they hope anything will go? You see my point? Is that they hope that, you know, well, my beliefs will fit in there too. You see my point? Uh, why do you seek a non-denominational church? So, so yeah, I can be who, however I want to be. Yeah, that's usually the case. Um, but, then, um, but then, of course, you know, there, there's the usual, uh, about 100 people shared their different, you know, churches and all that. And, um, um, well, anyhow, I can talk about that. But, but uh, it, it's, it's problematic. No, I want a, ch a church that teaches God's word, right? That's what I want, not a non-denominational. You know, 
But anyhow. All right, everyone there, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to start with verse 12. It's emphasizing the importance of each of us, every single one of us. <clears throat> For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit. So he's emphasizing there, look, I don't care where you come from, as long as you're saved, you, know, it, uh, you are in that, that family. For the body is not one member, but many. For if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our comely, and our comely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So let me start. Everyone is important. You know, so some people, well, I mean, but I'm not as important as that. Nonsense. Everyone is important in this body. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. If your foot hurts, uh, uh, is it, the, you know, do you hurt? Or is your foot somewhere across the room? <laughs> right? You see, no, of course, you hurt when your foot hurts, right? Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath sent some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, third teachers, after the miracles and gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Amen. So each local church like ours is made up of many members, many different parts. Now all of the parts, the members, differ in terms of <coughs> function and ability. Right? We have a, I'm telling you, for a, a small, relatively small congregation, it's unbelievable the talents that we have, the abilities that we have in this congregation. But an eye is an eye and not an ear, right? Try hearing with an ear. I mean, with an eye, right? Yeah, I hope you can hear with your ear. Yeah. Or maybe with some assistance in your ear. <laughs> but try hearing with an eye. You can't do it. Try seeing with an ear. You can't do it. It's not going to happen. It's the same way in our local church. Not everyone stands up and preaches, right? Not, not everyone is apt to teach, and that's why one of the biblical requirements for a pastor is that they be apt to teach. 
Not everyone stands up and leads the singing or plays the piano. Not everyone's going to teach junior church. Not everyone is apt to fix things when they break. You know, not everyone is going to be able to stop an intruder if, if they try to come in and harm us. Some people are better at encouraging than others. Some people are better at loving on people than others. You know, some people are better at teaching than others. Some people are better at soul winning. Some people are much better at being sensitive to the needs of others, you know, and praying for them. Some people are much better at cooking and preparing meals. But the point is this, and I put this in your book, everyone is important and no one is taken for granted. But you all need to realize how important each of you is. And how much you are missed if you are not here. We have an unbelievable amount of talent, like I said. But here's my point. We have to be willing to use that talent. We have to be willing to use it. Now, please uh, understand something. I'm not encouraging us to be a cult that lives in a commune. Okay? Understand that. But what I am saying is that our daily lives need to be in consideration of our church. I'm serious. They do. For us, for us to be the church that we can be, for us to get done what we, we need to get done for the Lord, our lives need to revolve around this. Each other. Our mission. And since it's the Lord's church and He's the head of it, when we make this church first and foremost in our life, guess who we are making first and foremost in our life? Jesus. That's why I put this in. God wants to be top priority in your life. That's not going to be happen if you try to do it alone. And don't you see that? A lot of people are, oh, I don't need I, I'll do it alone. I'll read my I don't need to go. I'll read the Bible myself. How, many, how often do you think they actually read it themselves? We are not meant to live this Christian life alone. And you know what? Honestly, we need to have this craving to be around each other and to learn. You know, a craving for that. To serve the Lord. To, to help each other. And honestly, I know many of you um, uh, don't have the biological family that you wish you had. You know? Well, right here is a loving family that that loves you. And of course, we will have our disagreements. Of course, there will be times when we don't see eye to eye. But, if we all agree that this church teaches the Bible correctly, if we all agree that this church serve, seeks to serve the Lord the way we're supposed to, that this church is one where we are here to help each other, then surely, I know, and don't call me Shirley, uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but surely we can kiss and make up. Can we not? Because the fundamentals are there. It's just like a good marriage. You know, uh, God only knows how many times over the past 40 years Sandy and I have had arguments, how many times she's been wrong. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> don't tell her I said that. Uh, you know, God only knows. But the fundamentals were there. So that we could always kiss and make up, praise God. You see? Rather than just taking on, you know, if there's a, a little argument or something. The fundamentals are there. So please make this church in its head, the Lord Jesus Christ's top priority in your life, you need it, your children need it, and your grandchildren need it, if not by example. All right? And you know what? There's an entire community out there that needs it. That needs it. So we, uh, I really want us to march into 2024 doing great things for the Lord. And... Um, we just need to all be together to do it. Amen? Amen.
Amen. Are you with me or not? Yes. Amen. 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 So, God willing to share what I think would be good things for us to do in the upcoming year and uh, next week and, and praise God for it. All right, so let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for all that you do for us and so grateful for your word. I praise you, God, for our church family and, and um, uh, help us, Lord, to uh, indeed uh, consider each other, uh, uh, to uh, provoke each other into love and to good works, um, uh, to encourage each other, to reach out to those when you know, maybe they, uh, they haven't been here for a little while, we wonder what's going on, uh, to, to have concern for them and to care, not to fill a seat, but because we love them and want them to be here with us and to take care of whatever reason, whatever is keeping them from, from coming and worshiping you. And, and, um, and help us, Lord, to, uh, as a church family, to always teach your word correctly, um, to, uh, uh, to live our lives o obeying your word, uh, to, um, uh, to, to live our lives um, rooted in, in your word and rooted in serving you through this church. Um, and Father, we, we ask you to always, always guide us to always obey as a church family, um, you completely. We praise you, God, and Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.